focus our minds on these uh, great, wonderful, challenging truths. Please help me to explain them clearly. Please help us to live in the light of them. And we pray this, not chiefly for our blessing, but for your glory. We ask it for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. Have you got your Advent calendars yet? Yeah, I think there are a few. Okay, I hope you haven't started opening them yet. Because, well, it's not quite Advent yet. Advent Sunday is uh, next Sunday. But uh, even if we haven't got the calendar, we've seen them in the shops. Uh, It's the Advent season. What is the Advent season about? Well, if you go to the Church of England website, they have a little introductory paragraph, which says this. Advent is a season of expectation and preparation. As the church prepares to celebrate the coming Adventus of Christ in his incarnation, first Christmas, and also looks forward to the final Advent as judge at the end of time. And uh, it goes on to note that uh, the Bible readings for Advent challenge the modern reluctance to confront the theme of divine judgment. And the four last things, death, judgment, heaven and hell, have been traditional themes for Advent meditation. Well, as I said, Advent Sunday is actually next Sunday when we've got light up Laleham. But since we usually begin Christmas early, well before December the 25th, I'm going to start Advent a week early. And uh, this week, the next three weeks, we are going to be looking at some of those themes that we might be tempted to otherwise avoid, a uh, theme of divine judgment, uh, heaven and hell, uh, as we look at Paul's second letter to the church in Thessalonica. It's a letter, as you'll see at the beginning there, uh, verse 1, from Paul, Silas and Timothy, but the chief author is clearly the Apostle Paul. If you turn to the end of the letter, chapter 3, verse 17, he refers to it as one of my letters. So it's chiefly by Paul, and he's writing to this church that very recently, perhaps just a few weeks, a couple of months earlier, he had founded in the Greek city of Thessalonica, which then, as now, is a major city. And from our passage, we can see that it was no easy option to be a Christian in Thessalonica in the first century. There was intense pressure on these new Christian believers to renounce their faith. Paul describes the situation in verse 4. He talks about your perseverance and faith in all the persecutions and trials you are enduring. And what were those persecutions and trials? Why were they uh, uh, facing them? Well, the message of Paul put every believer on a collision course with the prevailing culture of the city of Thessalonica. And if you want to find out what was going on, just flip back with me to page 1113. 1113 is Acts chapter 17. It's Paul's second missionary journey, as uh, we saw on the video. Usual, whenever he goes to a new city where there are no believers, he starts in the synagogue explaining and proving that, that Christ had to suffer, rise from the dead, proclaiming that Jesus is the Christ. But, verse 5, the reaction is not positive. And uh, sometimes it wasn't to his evangelism. Here, though, the reaction is particularly negative. Acts 17, verse 5. But the Jews were jealous. So they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob, and started a riot in the city. They rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. Goodness knows what would have happened. <coughs> But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the other brothers before the city officials, shouting, these men 
who have caused trouble all over the world, have now come here. And Jason has welcomed them into his home. So um, what's the issue that is causing so much upset, so much disturbance, so much opposition? There in verse 7, they are all defying Caesar's decrees, saying that there is another king, one called Jesus. They are declaring another king, one called Jesus. Now we know from Paul's first letter to the church in Thessalonica that from the very beginning, this was a part of Paul's teaching, that there was a coming king. Technical term is parousia, and that means a royal visit. It's at the heart of his message that the king is coming. But this king is the ruler of the whole universe, not just the Roman Empire. This king is actually divine, God himself, whatever the Roman emperor might claim. This king is not called Caesar, he is called Jesus. So proclaiming Jesus as Lord, the king who would come, that is a direct challenge to the claims and sovereignty of Caesar. To enter into kind of direct competition with the civil religion of the city. Well, as a result, Paul is forced to flee the city after just three weeks. Imagine, uh, you'd just been coming for three weeks. That's the only Christian input you've had, and then the vicar has to leave. You're left. What is going to happen to these new Christians? Would they cave in? Well, no. Amazingly, Paul gets the news that they have kept going. And indeed, not just that, they've been growing, growing in their faith. So no wonder Paul begins the letter as he does. So uh, back to 2 Thessalonians, we're on page uh, 1189, uh, and verse 3. We ought always to thank God for you, brothers, brothers and sisters, and rightly so, because your faith is growing more and more, and the love every one of you has for each other is increasing. Actually, this is very often the testimony of believers across the ages and around the world, that persecution proves to be counterproductive. It actually ends up strengthening the faith of believers. And I think one of the reasons is it forces us to decide whose side am I really on. And in committing ourselves wholeheartedly to Jesus, we find that our faith grows. And our love for our brothers and sisters who share that devotion to King Jesus is strengthened. Paul goes on to say that uh, he loves to tell other churches about this little church of new believers in Thessalonica. Verse 4, Therefore, among God's churches, we boast about your perseverance and faith in all the persecutions you are enduring. But of course, it is not just in first century Thessalonica that Christians experience persecutions and trials. As we heard from the video, Jesus said to his followers, if they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Elsewhere, Paul is very clear with anyone who becomes a Christian. He says, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Each year, the Christian charity Open Doors produces a carefully researched survey of persecution of Christians around the world. And they list the toughest countries in the world to be a believer. This year's report says this. The persecution of Christians has reached the highest levels since the world watch list began nearly 30 years ago. Across 76 countries, more than 360 million Christians suffer high levels of persecution and discrimination for their faith, an increase of 20 million since last year. Globally, one in every seven Christians 
live under at least high levels of persecution or discrimination for their faith. And some even die for their faith. Now, this is carefully researched. The total number of Christians killed for their faith rose to 5,898 in 2021. It is not just a first century issue. And of course, we can bring this probably quite a lot closer to home. If you're a Christian believer, would you say that you face any persecution or trials? If you don't, of course, it could be that uh, you're a little bit like me, that the constant temptation is just to kind of dial down my Christian faith so that I don't think it's going to lead to any adverse reaction in uh, any setting that I'm in. I think um, uh, when I was younger, uh, most persecution, if Christians experienced it, was verbal rather than physical or practical. Uh, You know, the kind of snide remark, the mockery, uh, perhaps the kind of uh, slight social exclusion. And of course, that can be really painful. Uh, to experience, especially when you're young. Uh, Just in the last few years, there's been the sense that our society is moving ever more rapidly away from its Christian moorings, and we are just beginning to see, uh, even in our uh, country, some more practical forms of persecution for believers. So if we are to speak up for a biblical understanding of marriage as between one woman and one man, or the createdness of us as men and women, that language is like walking into a minefield. Uh, Andy Bannister was just uh, referring to it. So do get there for next uh, Saturday morning to see what he's got to say. And we can still be grateful that there are many, many protections uh, that that, uh, help Christians as well. But we will be aware that that can have practical consequences, may have implications for, uh, for our work or as uh, the modern word puts it, of us being cancelled. So, we may be tempted to keep our faith quiet, private, anxious about how others are going to react. And of course, it may well be that uh, for, for some here this morning, you're considering becoming a Christian, submitting your life to the rule of King Jesus, and this is one of the things that you are weighing up. What are the implications going to be for me Uh, for my relationships, for my workplace. It may be something that's holding you back. So how could it be that those Christians, and those of us who are Christians here this morning, can not only keep going in the face of persecution and trials, but actually find that we are growing in our faith, growing in our love for our, our Christian brothers and sisters? How might it be that we could take the risk of boldly living for Jesus, of living by his standards of truth and integrity and honesty, when either those will prove to be unpopular or going against the great tide of those around us. What did the Thessalonians need to do to grow in their faith? What might we need to know? Have a look at verse 6. I think there is a little... Three-word summary. Beginning of verse 6, it's that God is just. God is just. Now, as we look around at the world at the moment, the world does not look just. Just one aspect of that would be that report from Open Doors. But Paul is telling us that God will not leave it that way forever. There will be a reckoning when God will justly judge everyone, when all the wrongs will be put right, when accounts will be settled. When will that be? Have a look at verse 7. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed, when he comes back. Here's the Advent theme. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. It's at the advent, the coming of King Jesus. So the one who currently rules but unseen in heaven will suddenly appear 
as he really is and initiate the day of judgment when justice at last will be done fully and finally. And you may be aware that Paul here is simply repeating the language and the teaching of the Lord Jesus himself. Here's Jesus in Matthew 16. For the Son of Man, he, the way Jesus commonly referred to himself, is going to come, the advent, in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. How does Paul uh, put it in our passage? What's going to happen when Jesus returns? Well, that's verse 6. God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and give relief to you who are troubled and to us as well. He'll pay back trouble to those who trouble you. That's, he's going to bring retribution and give relief to you who are troubled. That is compensation. And then Paul goes on to spell out a, a little bit more, uh, in more detail, what this is going to entail, verses 8 and 9. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. Uh, they will be punished, literally pay the penalty with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the majesty of his power. So what have these people done? They have not obeyed the gospel of our Lord Jesus. We might say they haven't submitted to the loving rule of King Jesus. They haven't trusted in his death. They aren't living in obedience to him. Now, this theme of judgment, the Church of England website said uh, uh, people will be tempted to avoid it. We may well feel that as well. Most of us find that this is not easy teaching in any way. But I have to say, I'm not sure it could be much clearer. And perhaps we can sense how it might be just and even good that this will happen. Paul certainly is confident that he is, that God will pay back trouble to those who trouble you. He's saying everyone will get what they deserve. On that day of judgment, no one is going to be able to claim that there's been a miscarriage of justice. There'll be no basis for a retrial. So in a sense, those who in this life say, I don't want King Jesus, will find that that is the reality for eternity. Some words of C.S. Lewis. He said, there are only two kinds of people in the end. Those who say to God, thy will be done. And those to whom God says, in the end, thy will be done. All that are in hell, choose it. That's the negative side. What about the positive? What about the Christians who have submitted to the loving rule of King Jesus but have suffered for it? Well, they're going to receive relief. And that is spelled out in verse 10. On the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people and to be marveled at among all those who have believed. Jesus is going to be glorified in us. We're not going to be separated from him from eternity. We are going to be in his presence and that is going to fill and be reflected out from us. And Paul says it will be marvellous. And I think Paul can almost imagine those beleaguered, persecuted, tiny little group of Christians hardly dare believe it. And you see what he adds there uh, just at the end of verse 10. This includes you. It really does because you believed our testimony to you. When Jesus returns, it will be the day of judgment. It's the moment when accounts are settled and the eternal destiny of every human being is determined. Now, if you have been to a variety of churches like I have, or have had different Christian experiences, you may be aware that some Christians, even some vicars, some bishops, 
say that because God is love, everyone will be okay in the end. You might say, well, yes, there, there may be a hell, but it will be empty. There'll be no one in it. I have to say that is simply not the teaching of Jesus or his apostles like Paul in our passage. Again, Paul is simply following the teaching and language of Jesus himself. Here's Jesus in Matthew 25. Then the great king will uh, say, uh, uh, then they go away either to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Every human being, Jesus said, is is in one of only two groups, each facing an eternal destiny. Well, as I draw towards a close, let me suggest a very imperfect analogy. This week, we have seen the liberation of Kherson in Ukraine. We might say they've experienced the return of the true ruler. Now, I recognise that there are complexities in the situation, if you'll allow me just to to simplify for the purposes of this. In the days and the weeks leading up to the liberation, how might people have been living in the city under that enemy occupation? They'd have a choice. Some would decide to collaborate because it would mean they have a relatively easy life. Others, though, would decide to be part of the resistance, even though it might lead to the possibility of suffering. What might help them decide? To collaborate or to resist? Under which rule to live? It might depend on whether they really believed that they were going to be liberated. Whether the ruler, the true ruler, was really going to come. Much would depend. And if they were confident that the Ukrainian army, the Ukrainian forces really were coming, it might still them say, yes, I'm not going to collaborate with this alien ruler. I'm going to resist and live for the true ruler. I think this perhaps helps explain verse 5, a verse I jumped over. All this is evidence that God's judgment is right, their experience of persecution. And as a result, you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God uh, for which you are suffering. Now, when we experience persecutions and and trials, the degree to to which we do, um, and for me, you know, is pretty minimal. But nonetheless, we we will all, to some extent, if we're following Jesus, have some experience of this. My reaction is to ask, what is God doing? Where is his justice? This is unfair. Why me? These kind of uh, slightly pathetic cries. Paul sees it entirely differently. His point is that if we are prepared to suffer for our faith, it shows what we really believe. It shows who we're committed to, which king we're following. It shows which side we're on. Like those ill-treated citizens in Kherson. As the uh, the Ukrainian army came in, if they found uh, a citizen in a prison, if they found a citizen with signs of, uh, of, of beating, they would be very confident that they, they were on their side. They had been suffering for their resistance. Similarly, when we experience any form of suffering, trial or persecution, Paul says it shows that we've been counted worthy. It shows whose side we're on. So, King Jesus is returning. There is a judgment day coming where the eternal destiny of every human being will be settled. If we don't believe what Paul is saying, or even if we're uncertain about it, gradually I think we will cave in to the values of the world. 
But if we really believe what Paul is saying is true, we will live for King Jesus. We'll put up with the persecutions. We'll push on through the trials. We'll even grow in our faith and love because it is worth it in the end. More than worth it. So I'm going to pray the prayer that Paul prays at the end of our passage. I'm going to pray it for us. You might like to make it your own. Add an amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would count us worthy of your calling, your calling to be followers of King Jesus, and that by your power, you would fulfill every good purpose of yours in us as a church and in us individually in our lives, and enable us to fulfill every act prompted by our faith in you, even where it feels scary, or the consequences are tough. And we pray this not just for ourselves, but because we want the great name of Jesus to be glorified in our lives as well as our lips, and for you to receive glory through him. And we ask this not because we're worthy or not because we're able, but because your grace comes to us, strengthens us, and equips us. Your grace through our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.